study of the book of, Rome, of James. After a few weeks off and some traveling and uh, wonderful outreach last week, what a blessing that was. Come to the end of chapter 4 of James, and I think there is some very pertinent wisdom, imagine that, in this passage. Um, profound passage in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. I want us to begin, though, with uh, the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 15, 16, 17, Paul's talking about walking in love, and, and he says this, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, that's simple enough, isn't it? But Father, would you give us wisdom as we look to your word? May we understand what your will is, what it even looks like, what it is not. Father, would you give us, would you give us your wisdom? Would you give us your insight? Would you help me to best I know how? to call attention to your words. Lord, it is your word that we need. So, Father, would you, would you speak to our hearts by way of your word this moment, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It is foolishness. I think Paul would say, I think James would say, we're going to hear James say this morning, it would be foolishness living our lives with no concern about God's desire, with no concern about God's will. The, the one who created us, the one who created all things, the one who holds the universe together, the one before whom we will stand one day to say to him, hey, I'm good. I really don't need your input, don't need your insight. How foolish that would be. And especially for God's children. Those who know him, those who know his forgiveness, has tasted of his goodness to say, hey, I'll take it from here. Don't need any help. James chapter 4, James begins that chapter addressing our uncontrolled desires and passions and why is it that you fight amongst yourselves and do all the crazy things you do? Why is there division in your midst? It's because your uncontrolled desires, your uncontrolled passions. Now, at the end of chapter 4, he's going to deal with the desire to control our own lives, the desire that we have to control uh, our outcomes, our plans, our daily lives, living our lives as though there's no concern for God's will. I really don't care what God would like me to do. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What does it mean? We call ourselves followers of Christ. What does that mean? Somewhere in that definition ought to be the fact that we actually follow Christ, right? He's leading. We are following. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think my Facebook profile might say that my uh, religious opinion is a follower of Jesus. Am I a follower of Jesus because I go to church, because I own a Bible? I think James would say, and we're going to hear this this morning, James would say, you're a follower of Jesus if you actually follow Jesus, right? Yeah. Entitled this message, Who's Calling the Shots? Who's Calling the Shots? Is our, our passions... Our desires, our, our will, is that what's calling the shots in our life? Who's in control? Is it the things I want to do, the things I want to accomplish, as wonderful as they might be? Or is it my Savior, my Lord, the one who created me, the one who gave his life for me? Who's calling the shots? 
So are you ready? Let's take a look at James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. The first thing we're going to look at is making plans without God. Just cut to the quick. Making plans without God. Verses 13, 14. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a, a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? There's a profound question. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Making plans without God. Life is a gift from God. Life is a gift from God. What are we, what are we doing with it? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, do all that you do for the glory of God. Everything you do, do it to the glory of God. And James says, come now. Come now. Now, that's maybe kind of weak translation in our English um, language and in the language that J uh, James wrote in. It was a little more stern. It was a little more serious. you got to hear me. you got to listen to this. Hear what I'm saying, James would say. You who say... Today or tomorrow, we'll go and do such and such and spend and go to a town and spend a year there and make a pro. You who say, or really you who live your lives in a way that says. You conduct yourselves in a way that says, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, these are my plans, and I'm just going to do it. And it's an attitude that characterizes such a life, a life that the Old Testament uh, prophet Amos, in Amos chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, Amos chastised Israel. He said, woe to you who, who say, when is the new moon going to be over so I can go make a profit? When is the Sabbath going to be over so I can go do my thing? Paraphrase, Amos 8, 4 and 5. What God was pointing at there and what God is pointing at here is those who say, you know what, I'll do my religious duty, uh, new moon festivals, the Sabbath, I'll do my thing for God, but then I'm on my own. I'm going to do my own thing. Come now, you who say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. If you're involved in the typical American workaday world, uh, you know the plans of, of people who say, you know, I'm going to work until I'm such and such age, and then I'm going to retire, and then I'm going to buy an RV and do whatever. And there's what a glorious plan that is. However, what if God interrupts that plan? Are we prepared for that? Are we even seeking God for, God, is that what you have for me? Reminded of the parable of the rich fool. Sort of descriptive by the title, the parable of the rich fool. In Luke chapter 12. He said there's a man who is, he was prospering. His crops were prospering. He was filling up his bins and his barns. Uh, until they were full, and he said, oh, I'm going to build more bins, and I'm going to build more barns, and, and I'm going to have so much to keep me going forever, I'm never going to be in want. And God said to that man, you fool, you have no idea that this very night your soul will be required of you. God help us not to make plans without God. And why might we, why might we consider making plans consider God when we make our plans. Well, James gives us a few things. Number one, we ought to maybe consider God when we make our plans because life is complex. Life is complex. Again, verse 13, come now, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we're going to go in such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit and do all these things. Life is complex. So many choices, so many options, so many decisions, so many paths. In James' day, now we've talked about, uh, in prior weeks, we've talked about the difficulty that James's church was facing with the growing persecution, uh, economic difficulties. But at the same time, in James' day, the, the Roman Empire was spreading, the Greek culture was spreading, uh, Greek was becoming the language of a larger and larger uh, swath of the known world. And so there's new opportunities to get out of your town until... 
prior centuries to James, you would basically do what your parents did, right? You would step into the family business, work on the family farm, practice the family trade. James is in a time where the, the world is expanding and opportunities are expanding. And apparently there was some, maybe many, in James Church that said, oh, you know, there's opportunities. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do the other. In our day, many opportunities, right? How many of you remember, or did you have, in high school, did you have career day? When all the professionals would come and you'd pick two or three, and, and don't ask me what I, yeah, I, <clears throat> I, di I, didn't, I didn't pick church work, that's for sure. Um, anyway, I digress. Hugely digress. Um, well, you know what? You want to step into the work world. Uh, you want to learn a trade. You want to join the military. Uh, you want to go to college. Uh, there's opportunities abounded, right? James is challenging us. Are we focusing on our personal profit, our personal business, our personal well-being? Or, as followers of Jesus, are we pursuing, focusing on God's kingdom, God's profit, God's business, right? Watch out, you who just say, this is what I'm going to do. By their lives. They were saying, apparently they were saying, I'm sure none of us do that, do this. They were saying, oh, I'm saved now, my sins are forgiven, I'm headed to heaven, see you then, Jesus. In the meantime, I'm going to do my own thing. All right, I'm going to chase my pursuits. Would we dare do that with our lives? Yeah, yeah, we sure would. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins. I'm good to go. Uh, if I have my way, I'll see you in 100 years from now. Uh, when I knock on the pearly gates, which is not going to happen, by the way, um, and I'm just going to live my life. I'm just going to do my thing. Life is complex, lots of choices, lots of options. That's why we ought to seek God as we make plans. Secondly, James would say, life is uncertain. Life is uncertain. First part of verse 14, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Life is uncertain. James seems to be borrowing from Proverbs uh, 27, verse 1. Don't boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will bring forth. The fact is, ready for this? You do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right? I do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. Last Wednesday, I lost a very dear friend. Uh, COVID compl compl complications. Uh, and Tuesday, I uh, attend his funeral and uh, didn't see that coming. This life is uncertain. I don't know if you've noticed that. This life is uncertain. We can plan. We can plan as if we know the future. We can pretend like we know the future. The fact is we do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. Listen, James is not against making plans. That's a wonderful thing. We ought to be planners. James is not against making plans, against moving, against making a profit, against doing business. What James is addressing is making our plans without acknowledging God. God, you know tomorrow. Jesus knows what's going to happen in your life tomorrow. You know that? Jesus knows what's going to happen to everybody who knows life tomorrow. That's why self-sufficiency is so insufficient. Because life is uncertain to us. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But God is sufficient. God knows the future. This life is uncertain. You don't know what will happen tomorrow. And third, James says life is brief. Life is brief. What is your life? James asks. What kind of question is that? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Like a vapor, like a mist, like a morning fog that covers the land and then the sun comes up and it just burns away. The older I get, perhaps the more I understand the brevity of life, that life, this life is short. It's a common theme in the scriptures. 
Uh, Psalm 90, Moses' psalm, he says, Lord, teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days that we might present to you a heart of wisdom. We can spend our days, we can waste our days, or we can invest the days that God has given us because this life is brief. Well, we may think that we've got all the time in the world to do what God's called us to do. Uh, we might want to rethink that. We do not know how much time we have. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. May I wax philosophical for a moment? Uh, and again, the older I get, the more that happens. Um, look at history books. So-and-so, they live from this date to this date. A sentence. Their lives were full, filled with things and joys and realities, and yet history looks back, and so-and-so was born this date and died this date. A sentence on a page. We, we discussed this passage yesterday in our men's breakfast. And guys, if you don't put on your calendar, plan to meet with us the first Saturday of every month. You're missing out. We just had a great, great time. And, and, and I, I tell them up front, everything you say is going to get stolen and used in a message tomorrow. Um, and we talked about this, this whole thing. And I said, someday my great-grandchildren, they're going to say, oh, great-grandpa Tom, he did this and this, it, it sounds like. I'll be like, I did way more than that. I, I did all kinds of things. I lived for a long time and did a lot of... But history will record just a... Oh, great-grandpa Tom, he did this. No, I did way more than that. There are days, you know those days that just seem to never end, right? That Groundhog Day thing. You know that day that just never ends. It's just, oh, well, when is this day going to be over? Weeks that just never end. When is this week going to be over? And yet we step back and look from God's perspective, and this life is just a speck, a speck on the line of human history. Life is brief, quite honestly. God blesses you with 100 years. What a wonderful full life that is. And yet it is still just a, a speck, right? Making plans. Living our life without God is foolish. Life is complex, life is uncertain, life is brief. May I say, God did not draw you to himself so that he could tell you what to do. God drew you to himself that he might spend time with you. That is the will of God, right? I, I want to inject that throughout this passage because this fat passage is brimming with what is our life? Just us taking our lives and doing what we want to with it, or do we understand, do we recognize God? God wants to draw near to us. Making plans without God. Second thing that James addresses is making plans without wisdom. Making plans without wisdom. He says, come now, come now, you who say tomorrow I'm going to do this and that, and I'm going to go here or there, and I'm going to do all this stuff. Verse 15, instead you ought to say, you ought to live your life in a sense that, that says, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Wow. The complexity of life and all the moving parts of your life and all the responsibilities and things you got to do and things you got to be responsible for. The uncertainty of life. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. All of that can lead to fear, right? I mean, not any of you, but normal people. Wait. <laughs> all of us, right? The, the complexity of life and all the decisions and the things and the uncertainty, like what's going to happen tomorrow, can lead to fear. So how do we step toward the future? How do we step toward a, an uncertain future? We can do it, one, fearfully, trusting in fate. Well, I just hope things are going to work. I have no idea if things are going to work, but I just hope things are going to work, fearfully. Or, secondly, we can step into the future pridefully, trusting in ourselves. I'm going to make it happen. How's that working? 
Or third, we can step toward the future wisely trusting in God. The one who holds the future. The one who knows tomorrow. I say it many times. I'll say it again. If you have a friend that knows everything, you ought to think about spending time with that friend. You have a friend in Jesus, Christian friend. You have a friend in Jesus. He knows everything. He knows tomorrow. He knows what's going on in your heart this very moment. He knows what the rest of this day brings. Making plans without wisdom is foolish. So what do we do? Number one, we need to seek God or seeking God's will. Seeking God's will. Instead, instead of saying, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. God, I, I don't know where you're at with this, but this is what I'm doing. Instead of saying that, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, I'll do this or I'll do that. Jesus said, Matthew 6, verse 33, seek first, seek above all God's kingdom, God's righteousness, and all the other stuff, all the, the issues of life, all the necessities of life will be given. Versus, God, show me what to do. Uh, show me what I ought to be about, and I'll think about it. I'll give it some time. I'll consider it. You ought to say, James says. It's more than just words. It's a conviction of the heart. My life says, God, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to walk in your will. I want to walk with you. That's an attitude of our lives. Rather than the attitude that says, hey, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. Seeking God's will. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 34. My food, my sustenance, my very life is to do the will of him who sent me. Would that God would allow us to live with a sense of that, huh? My food, my sustenance is to do the will of him who sent me. James says, instead you ought to say if the Lord wills. We talked about this yesterday some, um, and I, I really want you to understand what I'm... Jesus said, uh, Father, on the cross, Father, in the garden, before the cross, Father, if there's any way that we can pull this off, any other way, let's do it, but your will be done, not mine, right? So yes, uh, we ought to fill our hearts with God's will be done. And yet... <laughs> I know in my life, in my own prayer life, maybe yours as well, there's those times where uh, if, if it's your will, God, is just something we tack on to the end of a prayer, right? And it's sort of a cop-out, sort of a, um, well, God, I'd sure like for this to happen, but hey, if your will be done, and we're just going to wash our hands, it's on you now, God, I'm going to walk away. I think God wants us to be a little more involved in walking with him than that. Does that make sense at all? I really don't want you to misunderstand that. Yes, we pursue God's will, but sometimes, if it be your will, it's just a little tack on the end of our prayer, and so we walk away and say, it's on you now, God. I think that can be a cop-out. Does that make sense at all? Instead, we ought to say, God, would you please show me your will so I can stand on your will and I can dig in and fight for your will. I want to know your will, not just like, oh, whatever you want to do, God, I'll be in the, over here if you need me. But God, would you show me your will so I can stand on it. I can fight for it. I can do what God's called me to do, right? Does that make sense? I thought about this this morning. Uh, wives, I'm not talking to you. You can daydream for a moment. You can just check out and think about lasagna and cheesecake. Um, <laughs> Right? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your husbands now. So wives, we'll see you in a minute. Um, I thought, you know, as husbands, sometimes, I mean, none of you, of course, but sometimes we'll be like, yeah, this is, honey, this is what I kind of would like to do, but whatever you want to do is fine with me. You're not supposed to be listening. <laughs> um, I, I'm just, 40 years at this thing, I've got a hunch that's not what we're supposed to do, right? I think our wives want us a little more involved in the process than that. Like, like, uh, let's talk this through. Okay, this is what I'm kind of thinking. What are you thinking? Why are you thinking? Right, rather than, well, I kind of like this color, but whatever you want to do is fine with me. I don't think that's what our wives are seeking from us. 
And I don't think that's what our Lord is seeking from us. God, this is kind of what I want, but whatever you want to do, I'm fine with it. No, God says, would you draw near to me? Let's, let, me let me speak to your heart. Let me show you what, why it is I want this for you. Let me speak to you why it is this is going to be best for you, right? And be a part of the process of God's will. God's will is not so much about what we do. You've got to hear this. God's will is not so much what we do. God's will is all about who we are and what we are. We are children of God. We're not, oh, I'm a worker for God, and I'm going to do this and that. God's will has way more to do with who you are than what you do. A child of God, walking with God, hearing him. Listen, seeking God's will is not an event. It's a lifestyle. It's not a... Um, Hey, I, I, need a, I have a decision to make. Do I buy this house or this house? Do I take this job or this job? Do I uh, move here, move there? Seeking God's will is not an event. God, you got 30 minutes. I, I need an answer. At the end of 30 minutes, you're going to come through, or I'm just going to move on. Seeking God's will is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Daily. God, I just want to spend time with you. I want you to speak to my heart. I want you to change my heart. I want you to... Explain to me your heart, why it is you, you desire things for me. Again, nothing wrong with making plans, right? Nothing wrong with making plans. We ought to. Huge benefit to be a planner. What if God steps in and rearranges our plan? I've got all these plans, and this is what I'm going to do. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but sometimes God will step in and rearrange your plans You've all had that happen. Oh, wives, you're invited back in. You can. <laughs> what if God steps in and rearranges our plans? A couple of options I want to throw out. Number one, we can revolt. Oh, yeah? No, I'm doing this anyway. I don't care if it's going to be hard. I don't care what you think, God. I'm going to do it. We can revolt or we can rejoice. Lord, thank you. Thank you. I thought I had this figured out. Obviously, you've got something else in mind. Thank you, Lord, for working your, your will, your plan, your ways, your purposes in my life, right? When God rearranges our plans, our brilliant plans, because they're all brilliant, right? We can revolt. I'm going to do that anyway, because that's what I want to do. And I can, so I will. Or we can rejoice. It's in the words of Proverbs 16, verse 9. The mind of a person plans their way but the Lord directs their steps. The mind of a person uh, plans their way, but the Lord directs their steps. That says to me that we ought to be planning. We ought to be seeking what to do next. We ought to be planning for our family, for ourselves, for our vocation, for our career, for all of that. But it is God ultimately who is in charge of our steps. And so when we make our plans, we would do well to say, God, I just want to walk with you. I want you to show me what it is I'm supposed to do, I think. Um, I'm firmly convinced that the will of God uh, isn't a destination. Seeking God's will is, is the end, right? When we're seeking God's will, we're drawing near to him. Seeking God's will, that is. <clears throat> that is the end result. Seeking God's will is not a means to an end. I'm going to seek God so this works out better for me. I'm going to seek God's will, and that's it, right? That is where we ought to live. What if we get it wrong? I don't know if that's ever happened to you. What if we get it wrong? I choose door number one, and then er, that didn't seem like the right thing to do. What do we do when we think we get it wrong? James has already said back in verse 6 of chapter 4, God gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I am of the firm conviction that God's favor rests on those who humbly desire his will. Here's what I mean by that. When we, we're doing the best we can, we're seeking God. God, I need to know what, what, what I should do here, and, and so I'm just going to wait upon you. And then, Lord, this seems like the best solution. This seems like the best direction. I'm going to go this way. <clears throat> things seem to fall apart. I believe God gives grace to those who humbly seek him. And it's going to work. He's going to make it work. I've made plenty of bad decisions in my life, and yet 
I think when we humbly submit ourselves to him, Lord, I, I don't really know what I'm going to do here. I, I think I'm leaning this direction unless you, unless you make it real clear to me. Otherwise, I, I'm going to go in this direction. I think if we humble ourselves before him, he will give us favor. And he's going to even make our craziest decisions, what seem to be our craziest decisions, work. Does that make any sense whatsoever? As opposed to the proud who God opposes. God, I think I know what you want me to do, but I'm going to do this anyway. And, and I don't care what you say. That's, that's some uphill tough sledding. Because I know, I know, God, you're probably not in this, but I'm going to do this anyway. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So let's just humble ourselves. Let's take the pressure off ourselves, humble ourselves before God. Spend time with him. Let him shape our hearts. And, and daily, day after day, seeking God's will is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Surrendering our desires to his leading day after day after day. It's not a, well, I sought God once and it didn't work out. No, we seek God our entire life, day after day after, our, after day, and he changes our hearts. Next thing you know, we might be making some decent choices, right? Because we've been spending time with the lover of our souls. Seeking God's will. Versus, number two, settling for our will. Settling for our will. Again, verse 16. As it is, you, as, it, as you are, just seek and say, not, God, I'm going to do this and this and this, and I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Settling for our will. Last generation or so has, has um, coined this term practical atheist. And a practical atheist is a person who professes to be a Christian. Yep, I'm a follower of Christ. I love Jesus. And yet their life says, uh, God has no bearing on my life. I don't really care what God thinks. Practical atheist, right? A professing Christ, but I live my life in a way that there's no God. I don't care what he thinks. I'm going to do what I want to. James says that is boastful and arrogant. It is foolish. He says it is evil. James had a lot of words at his disposal. He could have said, that's kind of foolish. That's kind of silly. That doesn't really make much sense to live your life as though God didn't exist. No, James chose the word. God put the word in James' pen. James says that all such boasting is evil. Ouch. A person who says, yeah, I go to church. I, I give to the church, support the church. I, I serve at the church. And as soon as I live the leave the building, it's all, it's all me. I do my little religious duty. Back to Amos, right? Back to Amos. Uh, woe to those of you who say, yeah, when is the new, uh, new moon festival going to be over? When's the Sabbath going to be over so I can get about my business, taking care of our little religious duty? And when we walk out of the building, it's all me. James says that is sinful and that is evil, and it's obvious why, right? Because the one who created us, the one who died for us, the one we will stand before one day is longing to draw near to us. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. He wants to spend time with us, and we say, God, don't have time. I'm busy doing my own thing. That is the definition of evil, isn't it? Huh? Huh? And we're all guilty of it. Again, God's will. Not so much what we do, it's who we are. Children of God, walking with him. That, what's God's will for my life? To walk with God. That is God's will for your life. Right? Everything else flows from that. Everything else is going to happen from that. What is God's will for your life? To walk with God. To walk with the one who created you, who redeemed you. We might, we might use we, uh, our time and our money and our abilities in a, in a way that, that might be very honest and, and above board and all, but is it directed by God? If we're not spending time with God, the way we use our time and our money and our abilities is not directed by God for his purposes, for his glory, for his goodness. What is the will of God for your life? To spend time with God, Right? Let's boil it down to that. From that, you'll make all kinds of decisions. But as you fellowship with him, 
Those decisions won't often be easy, but they'll be full of purpose. I'm getting ahead of myself here, and it's getting close. Again, James is not questioning the legitimacy or the motive of earning a profit or any of that, doing business, certainly not. I think he would encourage it. But he is asking the question, is your activity directed by God for his glory? Again, seeking God's will is not a means to an end. I'm going to seek God, so this will work out for me. Seeking God is the end. It is the goal, right? Seeking God is the goal. That is the end. That is the mean, or that is the, uh, the destination. And last, James addresses, after making plans without God, making plans without wisdom, third, making plans without guilt. Listen to what he says in, in verse 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Huh. Uh, making plans without guilt. That verse could be inserted anywhere in the New Testament, could it? It almost like, is that an accident? Why is that there? He kind of broke his train of thought. That verse could be inserted anywhere. We use that verse. We bracket that verse uh, when trying to explain what sin is. Um, we say, well, there are s sins of commission, things that we do that we shouldn't do. Romans 14, 23, uh, whatever is not done of faith is sin. It means anything you do that's not directed by the, the Spirit of God is sin. Now, that broadens the, the definition of sin, right? Uh, sin is not just uh, dirty words and bad jokes and drinking too much. Sin is anything we do that is not of faith, not directed by the Lord. So sins of commission versus sins of omission. Verse 17, to know the right thing to do and not do it is sin. I know what I should do. I'm not doing sin of omission, right? That makes sense? Sins of commission, anything not done in faith is sin. Sins of omission, uh, if you know the right thing to do and don't do it, it's sin. So we use this verse, we bracket this verse, but James applies this to living our lives, to planning our lives, without seeking after God. And he seems a bit upset. After he said, uh, and, and he's got people, I'm sure, in his church that he's, he's thinking about, man, you're just making blame. It's like, yeah, you came to Christ, and now it's like, okay, now it's all me. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And I'm going to take care of my business, and I'm going to do whatever I need to do. James says, you know the right thing to do? Don't do it. It's sin. He seems a bit grumpy, making plans without guilt. And I want to just close with a, a couple of thoughts that I think this are implied in this passage. Number one has to do with the heartache of disobedience, the heartache of disobedience. The failure to stand humbly before God's sovereign will and to fail to do what he's directed us to do just leads to heartache. I know what God wants me to do, uh, but I'm not going to do it. And that just leads to heartache. James says, you're living in sin. You say, I didn't do anything. James says, that's the point, right? You knew what you ought to do. You didn't do it. God's moving on your heart. You know what you ought to do. You know God is drawing you into a closer relationship with him, and you're saying, no thanks. That is the problem. James is speaking to those who God has given them life, and now they have stolen that life back from him, and that, he's just assuring them, that's going to lead to guilt, that is going to lead to heartache. Paul says it this way in 1 uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 19, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. You don't belong to yourself. God redeemed you. Jesus gave his life for you. He forgave your sins, redeemed you from the pit, and now you're taking your life and saying, adios, see you later. I'm going to be off doing my own thing. Let me say this. I think you probably know this to be true. The most miserable guy in town the most miserable guy in town is not the guy who just 
is buried by his own addictions and issues. The most miserable guy in town is the, is the guy who knows God but refuses to walk with God. The most miserable guy in town is the, is the believer. They, they know who Christ is. They've tasted of the, the goodness of Christ, and yet they say, you know what? I don't think I want to draw any closer to him. If that's you today, that can all change today. Yeah, I know God. I'm so thankful for what he's done, but I just haven't surrendered myself to him. That'd be a great place for an amen. The most miserable, you know it, right? You know it. The most miserable guy in town is a guy who knows, he knows God, he knows how he ought to live his life, and, and yet he says, I, I think I get enough of Jesus on Sunday morning. <clears throat> you do not get enough of Jesus on Sunday morning. <clears throat> I know because I'm here on Sunday morning. <clears throat> you get enough of Jesus every morning as you spend time with him and he releases you to do what it is that he has for you to do. So let's not be that miserable guy, right? When we do that, when we say, yeah, I know God, but I just, I'm just afraid. If I draw any closer, I'm afraid he's going to see what's in me. I'm afraid I won't get to do what I want to do. And all of that goes on, and we miss, we miss the riches of the glory of Christ. Because we just don't want to draw any closer. We just don't want him to get any more grip on our lives friends he owns he owns tomorrow we ought to just surrender to him today the one who just says i get to do my thing is missing out on his thing and his thing i don't know what your thing is but his thing is a whole lot better than your thing because i know his thing is way better than my thing his thing is what we ought to be pursuing the heartache of disobedience, and by disobedience, I don't mean you do this or do that. Disobedience, as James is, is saying, not drawing near. God, would you be a part of my every moment, every day, life and decisions. The heartache of disobedience, and last, the freedom of obedience. The freedom of obedience. Certainly implied in this passage that the safest the healthiest, the richest, the most blessed place on earth is walking with God. Walking in God's will. The safest, healthiest, richest, best place on earth is walking with God, walking in his will. Uh, a few weeks ago, a couple days, well, the day before we left for um, Guatemala, I had, I had a friend say to me, is this a good time to be traveling around the world? And I said, I'll get back to you in two weeks on that. God opened doors. We walked through those doors, and that was the richest, safest, most blessed place on planet Earth that week for us. People say, oh, the will of God is, is dangerous, and it's scary, and it's boring. You don't know my God. If you think God's will is scary and dangerous and boring, you don't know the one who created you. And that's why he draws us into fellowship, right, day after day. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. That is a promise of the one who made you. Draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. Again, Jesus' words in Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek first, seek above all other things, his kingdom, his righteousness, and he'll take care of the rest. We're reminded also this week of Psalm 37, verse 4. One of my, again, when people say, what's your favorite Bible verse or Bible passage? And, of course, my smart aleck answer is, well, I really like uh, Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. Uh, that, that's like my favorite Bible passage. But, honestly, Psalm 37-4 has been a mainstay of just those nuggets of God's truth. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. Not go delight yourself in all your stuff and hope God chases you down and endorses that. No, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of the heart. How does that happen? Because when we delight ourselves in him, our heart changes. 
and our heart's desires change, and our heart's desires are, are things of him to bear fruit, our, our heart's desires to be used of him to, to minister to people, right? We delight ourselves in the Lord. He will give us the desires of our heart because the desires of our heart will change when we delight ourselves in him. That's what this passage, I think, boils down to. Come now. You say, oh, you know, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go. This is what I'm going to do with my life without any consideration of the one who holds tomorrow. Without any consideration of the one who knows tomorrow, who knows the future. We can pl make plans without guilt when we just walk with him. Yeah, I might miss this one. I've missed several of them, but God, I thank you for your grace that follows, that follows the humble, the humble of heart that say, God, I, I just, I want to make the right decision. I, I draw near to you. I think God, I think God delights in his kids drawing near to him saying, I don't know what to do. I've got these three great options. I don't know what to do. And sometimes God just allows us to, to move along and, and, and choose what we think is going to work based on our understanding of him and his word and our own selves and our own situation. And I think God blesses those who have the starting place of God if it's your will, right? Rather, you should say, if the Lord wills, I'll go do this and that. Does that make sense? Yes. As a conclusion, I um, <clears throat> left us with just a simple statement. May the Lord be the Lord of our lives. May the Lord, capital L, the Lord of glory, the one who created us, be the Lord of our lives. Lots of things can be the Lord of our lives, right? <clears throat> Many things. Many desires can be the Lord of our lives. We can be run by, lorded over by our desires, our appetites, our, our uh, addictions, by our culture, by money, greed, lust, you name it. But may the Lord be the Lord of our lives. May he call the shots in our lives. So friends, here it is. If you're here today and you're like, yeah, I, I just, my life isn't, it's not, it just doesn't seem as full as it ought to. I want, I want God in my life. I know Jesus is my Lord, my Savior. I've surrendered to him. But, friend, let the journey begin today. Right? Let the journey begin today. Surrendering our will to him. Surrendering to him. Uh, our time, our plans, surrendering to him our very lives afresh. God, your will be done in my life today. Let the journey begin today. If you've wandered and you just like going through life, hoping another church service is going to do it, friend, that's not going to do it. Here's what does it, by drawing near to the one who made you, by drawing near to the lover of your soul, the one who redeemed you, with his precious life. So friends, let's, let's, let's let the journey begin today, right? Let's let the journey begin today. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for challenging truth that we find in your word. Thank you for reminding us how foolish we are when we make our plans, when we conduct our lives, and we say through our behavior, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Father, forgive us. Father, we know, we know the heartache. We know the heartache of knowing you but not daily submitting to you. So, Lord, we, we stand upon, we stand upon your challenge to let the journey begin today. Seeking you in your word, seeking you in a, in a quiet time of prayer daily, walking with you. Lord, we, we're plagued by the question, what does God expect of me? What does God require of me? Lord, we're reminded this morning what you require of us is just us. That we would find ourselves seeking you in your presence. Lord, we are reminded that your will.
will for us is just to be alone with you. To trust you, to trust you for tomorrow. Seek first your kingdom, your righteousness, and not worry about the stuff that we need. Father, we are reminded you just want to spend time with us. As we begin, parable of the prodigal son, the father longed for the return of his son. Lord, we recognize you long for our return, that we would return, that we would return daily. Indeed, there is someone here this morning, maybe several someones, Later today, tomorrow morning, whenever. As the Father anticipates your return, He is going to rejoice. Friend, He is going to rejoice as you commit afresh, saying, Lord, I want to return home. I'm tired of running, tired of doing my own thing. I'm ready to return home. Friend, let me, let me assure you, let me assure you, God will rejoice. Father, we thank you for the crazy grace that you extend to invite us into your presence. Lord, may we no longer foolishly decline that offer. May we draw near to you. We give you thanks. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Just stand up and let's...